Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Show. And uh, I kind of got I got kind of got away from that opening uh, the last couple of weeks, but I decided I, I do like that little swirl of my finger, no matter what anybody else thinks. Uh, but uh, welcome once again to the Tim May Show. And uh, let's just get right into it. My special guest for this week and uh, have a really extended interview with him because I've always found him to be one of one of the more interesting fellows I ever covered at Ohio State. And boy, does he have an interesting story uh, from a football standpoint and everything else is Devere Posey. Uh, obviously um, a member of the Buckeyes in the late 2000, late 2000s, the first decade of this century, which is going fast. Just ask me. I just had my 69th birthday last week. But uh, he was also, you know, really promising, was going to be one of the uh, elite receivers career-wise in Ohio State history. But, of course, as you well know, uh, he had to give up almost all of his last season, his senior season, because he got caught up in that Tatgate situation, which we get into. I was just going to touch on it with him, but when you think back to all the lessons learned from everything that came out of that, and some of the, some of those lessons are still resonating in college football today, that, wow, you penalize these guys that much or that little, and uh, then along came NIL. You know where I'm going with that. But before we get to that, uh, Ohio State, one of the most important jobs in college football, especially over the last couple of decades, has been the starting quarterback at Ohio State. And that battle for the next starting quarterback at Ohio State is ensuing. Uh, even as we speak, uh, we got to watch the first scrimmage of the spring on Saturday. Appreciate Ryan Day letting us watch it because that hadn't always been the case the last many decades, but uh, until until the spring game. But got a little insight in that battle. I mean, Cal McCord kind of took the bull by the horns the last third of that scrimmage. The last half, as Ryan Day said, but definitely the last third and asserted himself as probably, uh, as should be probably, the, the man to beat for that job. He's been the backup to uh, C.J. Stroud the past two seasons. His closest pursuer, of course, is Devin Brown. It's still a battle. Uh, you know, Devin Brown is going into his second year at Ohio State, Cal McCord going into his third year. But uh, Cal McCord kind of made some plays as that as that uh, scrimmage ensued. And so first battle, first points, go to Cal McCord in that regard. But it's still a long way to that opener at Indiana on September the 2nd. So we'll see how that goes. You know, other guys that stood out, uh, Offensive line, they've got to find three new starters on the offensive line, and it looks like the real battle going on right now is at right tackle between Zen Mikulski and the uh, rising uh, Tegra Shabola. That's that's definitely something to keep an eye on. I know for those who are tuning in and wanting to know more about the uh, the skill guys, the quarterback battle. Well, that you know you're going to hear about that throughout this uh, throughout this month. But really what's going to make or break this uh, this offense is going to be that offensive line. And uh, Carson Hensman looks pretty good at the center spot at this moment. Victor Cutler, the transfer from Louisiana Monroe, is trying to make some inroads there, among others. And then, of course, Josh Fryer. you got to figure Josh Fryer is going to be the starter at left tackle, the new starter at left tackle when that season opens in his home state of Indiana. But we'll see. Somebody could pop up. But definitely that right tackle spot is – is some is the hot spot is something to keep an eye on, and uh, wide receiver wise, of course, two of the Ohio State wide regular wide receivers are sitting out the spring as they recover from little touch up surgeries or procedures. I guess is what you would call it. I'm talking about Emeka Egbuka and Julian Fleming, Marvin Harrison Jr. is out there, but of course they don't want to put him in too much jeopardy uh, as as the spring goes on because why would you do that? Uh, he's getting all his, he's getting his work in, you know, in the, uh, in the one-on-one -on -one sessions, the seven on seven sessions and things like that. But a fellow who really stepped up and really needs to have a good spring to assert himself with, with new uh, wide receivers coming up, uh, you know, through the freshmen out there running around and catching passes on Saturday, but a fellow who really needs to step up and did so in my opinion has done. So the last month or so is Jaden Ballard. Uh, he put on a little bit of a show as, as the, uh, as things progressed on Saturday. And then defensively, um, you know, where everybody's watching the cornerback situation, uh, you've got Denzel Burke, uh, Jordan Hancock, Denzel Burke, returning starter, had a little, a little bit of a sophomore jinx he had to work through last year. He's looked pretty good in the practices we've gotten to see, and I thought in the in the scrimmage he looked pretty good. Uh, Jordan Hancock, same way. 
uh, everybody came up, gave up some catches. You're going to against this Ohio State offense. Uh, and then at safety, you know, it's it's funny. You're you're looking for the new guys to watch, but I've got my eye on number 41, Josh Proctor, a fellow who was coming back from injury this time a year ago, uh, played quite a bit last year, but is really the old man of that of that secondary now. And the leadership, it looks like he's showing at one of those safety spots. He could really come on and uh, really be a big difference maker on this defense compared to a year ago when he played, you know, he was sort of in and out. Wasn't the necessarily the primary guy back there as the season went on. Uh, and then Sonny Styles, you know, he's got to get on the field somehow, some way you do believe. This guy is a tremendous talent. Uh, obviously played, what, 11, 15 snaps, whatever it was, against Georgia in the uh, college football playoff semifinal. Uh, but uh, as a freshman, as a guy who really should have been in his last year in high school last year, but he looks the part now, man, and he's roaming the field. We'll see if they get him involved. And then finally, overall, a, man, a young man who really just stands out, and that's whether he's catching the ball or just standing there, is Jelani Thurman, the freshman from Georgia, uh, tight end, six foot six, two hundred and fifty three pounds. Uh, you know, he caught a little swing pass for a touchdown late in that scrimmage from Cal McCord. And uh, I asked Ryan Day if it's you and Jelani Thurman one on one, what happens? And uh, Ryan Day says, "I duck." You know, <laughs> you got to see this guy. It's kind of like Ohio State's answer to Darnell Washington, Georgia's huge. Uh, uh, tight end from the last several years. And of course, during the game, he got banged up against Ohio State and had to leave the game. But uh, Jelani Thurman is quite the presence and uh, we'll see what he can add to that tight end room, which includes, of course, returning starter, uh, Cade Stover. Uh, but but uh, it was interesting to watch all that talent on hand and Ohio State still had, a, had a sporadic trouble covering the deep ball on occasion, which as you know, uh, was a real thorn in their side the last two games of the, the season when it really mattered. We'll see how that goes as the spring goes on. But uh, those are just some of the highlights of the spring game. And the reason I bring them up, even though a lot of people will tune into this podcast um, from around the nation, uh, Ohio State's one of the elite top five programs in the country, really top three programs in the country. And all of these battles mean something, not just in terms of the impact on Ohio State, but the impact – on the national championship race because Ohio State should be favored again to be uh, in the hunt uh, to to make the college football playoff and perhaps get another shot at making the, the uh, college football playoff national championship game. Well, with that said, let's get to my uh, interview with Devere Posey, a young man, like I said, I've always enjoyed being around. I enjoyed him as a player, enjoyed talking with his mom a lot way back when. And uh, he got caught up in, in some things at Ohio State, uh, his junior going into his senior year, which, you know, most Ohio State fans are aware of, the tat gate as it came to be, no came to be known. And uh, so he, we really get into that, a conversation about that, but also just about, you know, his pro football career, which took him on quite the, quite the odyssey. And, uh, and just how much this young man grew up from uh, the first time I met him as a 17-year-old to where he is now with a family and a couple of businesses. He wants to get into the media, deeper into the media field. We'll see how that goes. He definitely has the voice and, and the look for it and uh, definitely the expertise and the uh, background. So we'll see how that turns out for him. He's doing a lot of stuff around town with like uh, 97.1, the fan radio, uh, occasionally on on uh, Channel 10 and uh, is a it's kind of a must get interview for a lot of folks who kind of want to delve into the past of Ohio State football, but also his expertise on what he thinks about the current team. And it's, it's interesting. If you, if you want to just fast forward it and see what he says about uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. And about how folks should be enjoying getting to see one of the great receivers in college football history. Uh, he's right here, ladies and gentlemen, right in town, Marvin Harrison Jr. Going into go getting, ready for probably his last season as a college football player coming up. Uh, uh, Devere Posey has some interesting things to say about that. So without further ado, here's my interview with Devere Posey. First visit ever to the Tim May Show. Used to be the Tim May Podcast, Devere, but now it's the Tim May Show. Devere Posey, former Ohio State wide receiver of, of repute, 
in all kinds of ways, right, Devere? And then went on to have a career in the National Football League and the Canadian Football League until I think you've retired now. Am, am I correct on that, Devere Posey? Yeah, November 2021, I've been done. Wow. So now what do you do with the rest of your life? You're 33 years old. You're young. You're vibrant. You've got a you've got a family. Uh, uh, what's going on in your life right now as we speak, Devere? Like you're saying, um, you know, being being a good husband, a great husband, actually. And then, uh, you know, being a father to my kids, coaching my kids up and taking them to school every day. And then also I own a few businesses. Um, I have a logistics company with a partner. We we haul concrete walls. And then um, in my free time, I also do some radio and some TV stuff with uh, Channel 10 and 97.1. And that's what I went to school for was communication. So. Um, that's a very competitive, you know, hard world to break into. So I'm just trying to build my media real slowly and and, and hone in on those skills and and try to get into you know media somehow because I love talking about the game. I love watching. It's my way to stay connected. Um, I love kind of you know breaking down Ohio State football. It's it's obviously it's a passion of mine and something that I've loved for a very long time. It's really funny. The guys that we enjoy, at least I enjoy talking to the most uh, during their playing career at Ohio State, uh, usually end up doing this, what you're what you're talking about doing, pursuing uh, some type of media, because number one, they're good at it. Number two, you know, you are always an enjoyable guy to talk to. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, and uh, I wish you all the luck in the world. And of course, you know, if I can help you in any way, let me know. Uh, but but my point is, it's it's not uh, a surprise to me that you're having some success in that pursuit. Meanwhile, you're putting up concrete walls. I mean, what are you talking about, Devere? Oh, yeah. Well, I, we have a flatbed company, and it normally takes, like, the bulk of my mornings, early afternoons. I normally get to do radio and new stuff in the evenings. Um, I haven't made it to, like, that 12 to 3, 5, you know, 5. Yeah. Seven. yeah but, yeah, yeah. So we have a flatbed company, um, and it's a uh, – concrete manufacturer called fabcon we we carry their walls on our flatbeds they like place these big 45 48 foot walls on the back and then like all of these buildings that you see like the amazon buildings on like 3370 um can't think of that highway that goes east from new albany to um 62 or uh or 161 the 161 yeah. those buildings that are just popping up they're like lego pieces so yeah. like Crane takes them off of the back of the trailer and they just sit in the ground and just and then they put so much you can put brick on them but it's uh precast concrete and it's uh it's a nice cheap way to build a building and, and with the growth of Columbus you know next here in the next uh you know 10 to 20 years you know we as a carrier hope that we can be a part of a lot of these uh projects dude how come you aren't, aren't down there on the border no I'm just joking that's another that's a that's a joke <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, I saw some guys putting putting uh, some of those prefabs up uh, over. There's a building going up over by Bolton Field Airport or Southwest Columbus Airport, wherever they call it now. And uh, uh, and they were doing it in a wind like 10 or 15 miles an hour. And I'm just going now, you know, yeah. people people think guys who play football or sports for a living are brave. Guys putting up prefab, really heavy concrete walls in a wind. Uh, yeah. That's kind of nuts, though, right? It's nuts. We really on our most windy days or rainy days, precipitation days. You know, we're kind of we shut down. But um, but I don't drive or anything. I just I manage everything. I um I dispatch and make sure we get there on time and manage the relationships between the um manufacturers and us and a lot of scheduling. But we we've been able to put some people in place and we've been doing it for about three years. So we're growing slowly and um. You know, it's business, it's competition, but I, I love the competitive nature of it, and um, it's fun to do, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah, I didn't mean you were out there driving a crane or anything. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just talking about the actual act of putting up those walls. Is I don't know how you, I don't know how you find guys that do that. You know what I mean? That's just uh, phenomenal. Yeah, that's... Me. Hey, but, you know, the reason I wanted to talk to you is, uh, you know, we're sitting here, Ohio State's uh, deep into its spring, uh, spring practices now. And uh, just had their first really good scrimmage of the spring. I think they have maybe three or four max 
in the spring because, you know, you don't want to wear guys out and stuff. But I was just thinking about you when you first showed up at Ohio State, what, in 2008? Do I have that right? I mean, uh, yep. but but the bottom line is you walk into a, a wide receiver room that's pretty talented even then. You know, we talk about these the later these latest wide receiver rooms like they've been unprecedented and maybe they have you know in terms of just pure depth of of big time talent but but the point is you were in spring drills back when you were a youngster and yeah. uh what is what is it like when you're fighting for recognition you're fighting to get that shot you know to get on the field in the fall what mm -hmm. what was spring all about what do you remember it being all about in your in your day um my freshman year, I came in the fall camp, and um, that year it was guys like Hartline, Brian Rabisky, Ray Small. Um, a, a, it was a real older room with yeah. a lot of knowledge in there. So that first fall, I got a crash course on the way to prepare. You know, we had defensive guys like Malcolm Jenkins, James Laronitis, you know, Marcus Freeman, Anderson Russell. Uh, Cam Hayward was a young guy. Yeah. Just being able to go, you know, Donald Washington, just being able to go against those guys, those guys that summer, I always learned like the way, how serious Malcolm was, you know, when we're doing those drills with no coaches around, like he was running the drills, running the seven on sevens. And, and I just was a really competitive young dude, man. I wanted to show that I belong, you know, in whatever, whatever it was, whether it was the stadium runs, gassers, the weight room was always a little bit hard for me just because I had like a long wiry frame, but you know, I knew I couldn't, what I couldn't do in the weight room, I knew I could outrun people just coming off a, of, you know, state championship, you know, 400 meter dash. So I was in like, I missed that shape, Tim, you know, <laughs> like yeah. I, I, I couldn't run a 400 if somebody paid me a hundred million dollars, man. But, uh, <laughs> but no, so I just remember, you know, those leaders just really putting a lot of, football knowledge into me early. And then, so after my freshman year, obviously I was beyond Heartline and, and Robo a lot. And I just saw the way that those guys prepared. And, and I think Robisky gets forgotten about um, in that long line of receivers, just because, uh, you know, he was like after 10 and then like, but he was a technician. Heartline was a technician and just being in the film room with them and Daryl Hazel, it was, it was a great experience. So going into my first spring ball, I was like, you know, fighting for a starting job. Um, so I took it very seriously that that spring and that that well, the winter workouts were huge for me because I wanted to bulk up and really show, you know, that I could um, you know, take those hits at that level. But um, yeah, so spring was like my first experience as being a starter and showing that I could be an ex receiver. And so it was very important to go out there every day and um and show what I could do. But the only thing with me in spring ball. I would have great spring practices, but I never had a big spring game. Like I would have <laughs> always, like I, like I never had a hundred yards in a spring game. I don't know what it was. Like, I don't, it just seemed like, like, to be totally honest with you, I, I hated spring ball. Like I just didn't like playing football in spring. I was a three sport guy. So I was playing basketball and running track. So it just kind of blew my mind. I'm like, why are we practicing right now? <laughs> yeah. But, I took it and um, it helped me go into fall camp my sophomore year, you know, as the clear cut starter, me and Dane Sands and Bakker. And, um, you know, I was able to play my sophomore year and start. So it was, it was an awesome experience. Yeah. Play golf occasionally with Dane. I mean, you know, he's come on yeah. my favorite guys, you know, you, you, you guys, man, I, I enjoyed covering those teams, man. Uh, uh, just y'all were, y'all were all individuals, you know what I mean? But great personalities. And, uh, uh, just the just that cavalcade of names you named off just getting into that. But I wanted to ask you this, was it did as you're trying to establish yourself as a starter, you know, or or work your way at least into the rotation and stuff, are there sleepless nights involved? You know there's competition. You you understand what I'm saying? And and is it is it a sense like now with as loaded as it looks like Ohio State is on the offensive side of the ball in the skilled positions, do you think there are guys who understand, hey, this is this is my moment to make it or break it. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, because there's always new guys coming in the door. There's uh, the the uh, the older guys that you, you're trying to unseat. I mean, what what is that like just from a mental standpoint or a psychological standpoint? I think for me, like a, a term that I heard, you know, just come from Cincinnati was, hey, man, don't don't get lost in the sauce. And yeah. when I was younger, I didn't 
I didn't understand it. But as I got to Ohio State, I started to really realize like what that meant. And it's and it's like you're saying the process of new new recruits, new five stars, four stars coming in right behind you and you having haven't yet established yourself as a playmaker. And so I always like feared like not getting lost in the sauce, but I also like trusted myself because I was like one of those guys that like you're going to have to kill me to beat me as far as like competition. Like I'll, I'll outlast you. I'll out tough you, whatever I have to do to like, and, and it's not, you know, physical competition with the guy next to you. It's the guy across from you, that defensive back, those chimney check was Devin, Tor- Devon Torrance's Donald Washington, Malcolm Jenkins. And, and it's like, you're going against guys who played in the national football league every single day. And so you want to go out there and compete and just be the same guy every day. So I think that was like my recipe for not getting lost in the sauce was just finding some type of competitive edge that kind of got me hyped every single day to go out and show what I can do. And I think a lot of guys that are battling for positions, you kind of, you're on your own, you know, journey. And uh, like you're saying, like those sleepless nights, I think I was in like a tunnel that like lasted probably, you know, 18 years from like <clears throat> my junior year, summer of high school to about November 21. And it was crazy. I was talking to this guy, I was doing this, um, you know, this mental health, like sort of like mental cleanse, heart cleanse, emotional cleanse thing recently. And he was saying to me, I bet you're tired. I bet, I bet, you know, your feet hit the floor every day and you're just pure will and pure grit. And for a long time, I was just driven by that goal, right? The drive, you know, driven, you know, it wasn't, it's not sleepless nights, but like the fear of failing, right? Yeah. The fear of not having the full potential. And, and you go into these, you know, these kids are getting recruited, you sign that letter of intent and you enter that 10 year portal where, you know, that light at the end of the tunnel gets bigger and bigger every single year. And, and that light is, you know, the end of your career. Some guys, you know, their career ends after college. Some guys are blessed enough to play in the National Football League, whatever, CFL, XFL, USFL. But when you're in that world, Tim, every day is a battle, right? Every day is it's a mental warfare of can I perform at my best? What what do I need to do to perform at my best? And it's, it's not really a battle of like nine to five, but more so the battle of like 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. And like when I started understanding that what I did off the field reflects what I did on the field, it really helped me stay, you know, focused through that tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. What a tunnel too, man. <laughs> it, 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 can, it, can, it can be well lit and it can have creepy crawlies in it. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like. There's some dark places in that tunnel for, for sure. The lights throw out a few few years, few months for sure. Yeah. Hey, I, I just want to touch on this. You know, you were you were part of the the, the guys that got caught up in that net. You know, uh, at the end of the 2010 season, and uh, uh, you know, with the, the, the you know, you know, as you as we as it was euphemistically called the Tat Gate. You know, whatever. And then you had most of your senior season in 2011. Obviously, Jim Trussell had. Jim Trussell, in essence, was forced to resign or resign uh, going into that 2011 year, uh, whatever. You had to miss almost all, which was the most ridiculous penalty I've ever dealt with. I've told you before, man, I, I, you know, nowadays, everything that happened then would be totally legal. You know what I mean? But uh, from the NCAA's eyes. But my point is, did that, what, you had to miss almost the entire season. You came back for what? How many games? I'm trying to remember. Was it three? Yeah, yeah. three games. Yeah. You know. Yeah, my first game back was senior day, which was it was a lot of sensory. It was a lot of emotion. Yeah, um, yeah. I played in three games. <clears throat> it was um, Penn State senior day at Ohio Stadium, and then um, we played at Michigan. It was like one of those losses in that ten year span that. If Braxton just, just yeah. touch, or maybe if I'm, you know, 10 pounds lighter, yeah, you know, and I can run under the ball, whoever it's fault it was, you know, me and Braxton have, you know, oh, done yeah. that over 60 times together <laughs> since then. Um, and then uh the bowl game, Gator Bowl. So yeah, I missed 10 games and it was it was a battle of mental warfare for sure. But 
I think the best part for me was um, I really got to, uh, you know, go through something that I could still use today, right? Um, because you're you're at a place at Ohio State where you're the number one wide receiver, number two, whatever you want to call it. And um, everybody around town loves you, you know, the state of Ohio. And, and what I didn't realize was how national Ohio State was when I played. You know, my, my cousins who lived in Atlanta would say, man, we go to the Ohio State bar to watch you. And I was like, wow, like, that's crazy. And then, you know, that, that story comes out and it's national news. And we go through what we went through leading up to the Sugar Bowl. They hand us the penalty, but say, hey, no, we're going to let you play in the Sugar Bowl. And then we're going to give you more games in your senior year. And just, you know, leading up to that junior was it was it was tough to make that decision to play or not, because, you know, Trust was having issues, you know, beating SEC teams. What's our what is our NFL future hold? We want to let the seniors like Sanzenbacher and Cam Hayward go out, Brian Roll go out the right way. Yeah. Um, so we decided to all play. And um, we decided to appeal the case and it was just a long process. And what people don't know about whatever tattoo gate that it was a name, image and likeliness case that we got in trouble for making money off of our persona. Yeah. It's hard for us to really wrap our minds around when there's video games, jersey sales, you know, posters in the mall, you know, people are, you know, you see people getting, you, you see people making money off of who you were. And yeah. uh, and I think that was the toughest thing is that you're like, does nobody see what's going on here? And, um, and just the picture that was painted, but more importantly, right? Like that pain is uh, CJ Strouds and, you know, Jackson Smith and J those guys got to, you know, walk, walk in the light this year and, and get those deals. I was at United Dairy Farm just getting gas and I see a beef jerky with Paris Johnson on it. Yeah. And I'm just like myself, like, that's that's cool, right? That's cool that guys can have NIL deals with beef jerky companies in Ohio and make money. And um, and at the time, obviously you don't know, you know, what what's happening. But if if you look back into the history of like name, image, and likeliness, you know, our case is a big, you know, case that helped. You know, like and like you said, it like the penalty didn't fit the crime, so or whatever, whatever it is. But you know, when when you sign on to the NCAA, you're, you're signing on to a list of rules, a set of uh, commands that allow you to participate in that organization and allow you to participate on Saturdays to be displayed on national TV, right? So yeah. I don't have to follow those rules, and so. Um, it was it was just a a good lesson of you know business disassociation and the thing I love was how guys like Fickle and Stan Drayton um, and and Gene Smith really and uh, Coach Trussell before he, you know he stepped down really pushed us through and, and told us to say hey you know take the high road you know come to practice and and um, walk through this and you'll be a better man for it and, and I'm happy I listened to those guys because it it, it helped me develop a. Uh, you know, uh, like a layer of toughness that I was able to use in my NFL career, right? Because yeah. I was on several teams, and and it was really nothing that could shake me after that. Hey, one issue this though, even back then, the NCAA blade just missed all these opportunities back mm -hmm. then. I mean, even before that, I mean, I was writing about guys should be compensated. 40, 30 years ago. I mean, you know what I mean. You could see. I'm not talking about over the top, but I'm just talking about. There's got to be something more, especially for football players, because life, limb, uh, and health, you know, you put it on the line. I'm not saying other sports don't, but in football, more than any other sport, you're putting your your blood and guts on the field sometimes. You understand what I'm saying? And uh, uh, I didn't understand why it, would, it took them. And it did, they kept kicking the can is the term I've used and others have used. Kept, kept, kept kicking the can down the road, uh, you know, not addressing it. As you looked out back then, what would have been an, a, a thing that the NCAA, and by NCAA, the NCAA is Ohio State. You know, it is USC. It is Wyoming. You understand what I'm saying? It's not just this governing body sitting in a castle somewhere. What is something they could have done that would have 
in, as you look back on it now, appeased you guys, meaning, uh, meaning make you feel like you're being compensated. What would have been fair back then, do you think, Devere? You know, it's what's so interesting about that. I, like I, we were talking about um, what I studied in school. I was a communications major. Yeah. And I had the speaking class and I had this partner. We're still friends today. He actually lives in Hawaii. We went and visited him the, earlier this year, but I met him in my public speaking class in our this for that quarter we had to do a speech that lasted 30 minutes uh Lee me and him picked why NCA athletes should be paid so we had to spend a whole quarter researching reasons why and we had to come up with solutions so part of those solutions at the time that we came up with the Olympic committee has a model where they have trust for the Olympic athletes right because a lot of Olympic athletes enter Olympic competition and they're amateurs. So the money that they make from marketing, they put it in a trust and they keep it up until they're like age 22, 25. So that if they want to compete at the NCAA level, they don't, all the money they made, you know, through marketing or, you know, via whatever uh, competition, you know, pots or whatever they make purses, they can get that money in that trust after their amateurism is complete. Yeah. So that that's a way that that we thought about. Um, another way was um, creating a union, so so if you will, that can negotiate with the NCAA for a percentage of the TV money, right? Because that's a big part. Like that's what a lot of the collective bargaining agreements with baseball, basketball, and the NFL are. Those are major points. Who's splitting the TV dollars, right? And that's why, if you look at the NFL per se, that's why guys like Joe Montana made so much money, or Tom Brady's making so much money. And then you look ten years later, now Kirk Cousins has made more money than Tom Brady has ever made. Yeah. And I don't know how accurate. I'm just giving an example, but it's yeah. because the viewership dollars that have increased, the marketing that the NFL has made in that time. So allowing the NCAA students to create some type of union to negotiate there. And then also um, redlining the National Letter of Intent, right? Because the thing about the National Letter of Intent is you're signing away your rights as a United States citizen. So when we went through our case and the appeal, what was tough and how they got so deep is because we had to turn over, you know, email records, phone records, bank statements. Those things can't be subpoenaed in the court of law unless there's like a federal, you know, need for it. So yeah. when we went through our case, we could have been protected if we would have kind of like redlined that thing that, or that line that basically makes it, it's, it's essentially the 13th amendment, right? That yeah. prison. And so to participate in this, you kind of forfeit your rights as a United States citizen. So it, it, we went pretty deep on that project. Obviously we got an A plus on it. And um, some of those things to protect the guys legally, obviously the trust fund to, to to save up for the guys for after football and then um, or whatever collegiate sport. And then also just participating in some of the revenue that the big wigs make. Yeah, it's funny because I wrote a, I wrote a thing many, many years ago. This this the amount of money I'm fixing to mention is a. Uh, is an example of how long ago it was, but it was like for every scholarship athlete, you know, you complete a, you complete a year in good standing, you know, at Ohio state, you know, whether you're red shirt or playing, you got $5,000 put into a trust fund, uh, you know, per year. That way guys left early, you know, they got, you know, after three years, you'd get 15, you know, uh, yeah. But if you stayed and we're, like I said, we're in good standing, you'd have 25, you'd have a $25,000 pot sitting there yeah. after you graduated or, or, your eligibility was up that you could use any way you wanted. You know what I mean? For one of another, you could buy a car, you could put a down payment. On. My point was you were being compensated somehow. That was just a rudimentary way of getting into it. And like you said, all the numbers now have just blown up exponentially, you know, it, it's where it's going. But I just don't, I'm just wondering, as you look back on it now, did, did you ever wonder why the powers that be, the administrators, the guys running the show, couldn't see that then that 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 this 
that what happened over the last year and a half, two years was coming in some form or fashion. Do you, do you, you know what I mean? Do you, do, you, do you look back and go, they had their head in the sand? I mean, what 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 is your take on that aspect of it? Of Guys who couldn't have made that difference didn't, you know? It's very interesting you say that. I, I've always felt that the rules that were enforced were sort of, you know, archaic, but they were the rules. And um, what's interesting, yeah. a lot of the people who were enforcing the rules sort of like that good cop, bad cop thing, right? Like they've, they've turned um, a few guys uh, who investigated us. I won't mention the names, but they were on the committee that went to Supreme court that petitioned that college athletes should be paid. Right. And our case was a big reason and turning point in their career, former yeah. NCAA investigators who saw that side of things and, saw like what was going on right and 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 I guess like the craziest thing is is to to put a, a good product on the field you know they go into communities and recruit kids you know like myself um you know African American guys and and uh, are people who come from you know these these rural communities who would never have the chance to be able to be on TV but to make a good product, it's a beautiful farm system, right? Like it's, yeah. it, it's, it's when you think about it from a business standpoint, you know, these guys can come here, make money for us and we don't have to give them a dime. And what's even more interesting is at a place like Ohio state, the scholarships are endowed. So people who love Ohio state who donate money, they basically sponsor you for your scholarship for your four years. So it's not even like the NCA is granting you this. They're just put in position to police the rules and the rules that allow you to be viewed on a national level, right? It's all about TV. Yeah. And so um, I think that's what's interesting. I think they knew for a long time that this was coming. And, um, and also they kind of, threw us a bone and let us, you know, threw us a bone and threw us in the desert. Like you guys navigate this name, image, and likeliness stuff, which is very tough now. But as we're coming through this desert, the real money of what, what, what I just spoke about, like the TV dollars and how the monies get allocated, we haven't even crossed that line yet. Right. right. We haven't even, they don't, that's the real money. So it's very interesting that they gave us this, but still kept that. So they waited long enough to where to where y'all, meaning ath student athletes now, are being compensated by everybody but them. You know what I mean? Now, let's grant. I mean, an Ohio State education and a scholarship is worth a lot of money. I mean, there there's no doubt about that. But is it over and above? Is it worth? You guys, you know, in my opinion, like I've always said, are worth over and above what that worth was. You know, that's my point, you know, and uh, that was always my point and, and everybody else's point. But it is funny. But uh, but, it, you know, they created their own chaos by kicking the can down the road. And and let's face it, you know, it's 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 literally like y'all were employees, but you weren't recognized as employees because, like you just said, they had the right to look into every nook and cranny of your life. At, yeah. And if you if you opted not to let them look at your bank account or at your phone records or your then you were suspended. And you know what I mean? I mean, they they that, that was what was crazy about it is uh, obviously Terrell opted, you know, to leave school early, you know, and uh, uh, if in fact leaving school early is the right term there. But, you know, I just remember all the work uh, attorney Larry James did on behalf of some of you guys and just how he would prove points, you know, but the NCAA would literally literally turned in essence a blind eye to some of those things because they had uh, their agenda on that thing. I'm talking about the investigators and they were going to pursue it. And, you know, and, and, and I will say this though, the idea that everything that happened way back then should have been corrected in hindsight after NIL came along, name, image, and likeness came along and stuff. I didn't agree with her either because, you know, that's like if you get a speeding ticket for going 45 and a 35, yeah. You know, when it was 35 miles an hour, but then they change the speed limit to 50. They don't give you your money back. You know what I mean? At that moment, you broke the rule. You know what I mean? But uh, anyway, let's don't get past. Let's you got past that. You know, you got drafted by the Houston Texans, I think, in the third round, if I remember correctly. Yep. And then you went on this uh, 
this jur this uh Iliad and the Odyssey. You know what I mean? You went on this Odyssey of of pro football and uh uh number one, uh you thought you'd made it when you got drafted in the third round by the Texans, right? You were uh, just give me that idea from a career standpoint of how you felt hearing your name called and uh and getting on with your life. Yeah, it was it was a, a feeling of uh wow, you know, you can still achieve your dreams, you know, even in the darkest places. And um I think yeah. for me the pre-draft process was was very, very important. Um I was blessed with an amazing agent, Mike Parrott. He was actually Cam Cam Hayward's agent and Cam really spoke highly of him and um and the thing I love about Mike Parrott was uh he was very aware of the situation. Um leading up to the draft, we had training sessions with um a former GM who helped us sort of like shape our message towards the NFL because the thing with you know getting in trouble with college, um a lot of the pre-draft process, and I'll say this, is built on character, right? Like, it's easy to turn the film on and, and watch you run at the combine, but they want to know who they're investing this money in, and is it a good investment, like like from a business standpoint? And so we had to kind of shape our business plan or shape our, our you know, our message as, hey, we messed up. Um, we know that that rule isn't a big rule, but hey, like, can we move forward? We love football. What what can I do to show you that I'll be a good pro? And so going to the senior bowl and having a good senior bowl and having good meetings was, you know, important. Check that off. Going to the combine, having good meetings and running well. Check that off. You know, the, the visits, check that off. You get drafted. Your name gets called. It's a great feeling, right? But then you get to a city where, okay, you haven't played football. And you played three games over a year span. You kind of got to get back in shape pro shape um for me my rookie year I probably like hit my stride like in October um and was able to really really uh you know start making plays and then you know our last game of the season four minutes left snap my Achilles right um and then so you know I'm in the training room and they're like hey you know we're gonna draft this guy you know from Clemson I really want you to help his learning curve so like that's what's hard about professional sports is that you have to build relationships with people who you're competing for millions of dollars with. Yeah. Right? Or try to take your job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the professionalism of professional sports, right? Like there's this corporate world, this corporate, you know, dialogue that you have to follow or, you know, HR that's, that's what that translates to in the professional world is being able to compete, but also be a great teammate. Yeah. And so less than my second year coming off an of injury, we were horrible that year. Kubiak had a heart heart attack. Wade Phillips takes over halfway through the season. You know, we're two and six, two and fourteen. And then the next year, Bill O'Brien comes in and, you know, and it's just like it's it's this thing where coaches, they want their guys. It's just like recruiting in college. Like they want to recruit their recruits. Nobody wants to be known for winning with someone else's player. So I had that a little bit and requested trades and ended up getting traded to the Jets in 2015 but I love the Houston Texans organization for giving me a shot love the town of Houston my oldest son was born there grew up a lot in that town I was fortunate enough to be drafted to a, a pretty old team with like Arian Foster Andre Johnson was in year 10 Matt Schaub Kevin Walters Owen Daniels Wade Smith you know Brady James just super vets who I could see them interact with their families right and be and be professionals yeah so um, it was it was a pretty cool experience for me. I learned how to be a pro in Houston when I got to the Jets. Super packed room, right? Had 18 receivers when I got drafted there. 18? 18 guys. Um, couldn't stay healthy there, and I find myself out the league. Um, I'm just training and, and um, working hard. Um, Kubiak ends up in Denver. I signed a future deal. I end up in Denver that next training camp, right? And they had just won the ran the table in the playoffs and won, you know, the championship Super Bowl Fifty with Peyton Manning, and yeah. it really don't change anything about the room, right? It, that that OTAs really wasn't about competing; they were still partying and celebrating. So, um, I think what was tough about that year was trying to integrate with a group that was very tight knit that won a championship, 
but also still compete, right? That that weird element about professional football. Um, so I oh, wait, I'm getting, it's like it is like that band of brothers kind of thing, you know. It's like, you yeah. know, like you know, even from the military, you know, all of, you fought these wars, and all of a sudden now here comes this new guy. Yeah. It's, it's hard to yeah. fit into that group, right? It's tough, but you know, a lot of the guys that I was able to play with out there were really great dudes. Emmanuel Sanders, you know, rest in peace, rest in peace to his soul, Demarius Thomas, Benny Fowler, Cody Latimer, some other Big Ten guys, and they were. Uh, off Jordan Norwood, Penn State got awesome set of dudes, right? Just great men. You know, we still communicate via social media and um, just being able to be around those guys and see how they won a championship. It was something special, but I, but also the desire for me, you know, fighting back from an injury, you know, helping, you know, rookies get on the field. Like I want to play. And so I, I just kind of committed to not being, the 56 or 57, 58 guy on the team who gets cut on the last day. So I wanted to play. So um, I asked my agent say, Hey, like, what do you think about Canada? And he kind of was like, you want to go play? It's a two year deal. You play well enough. A lot of guys make it back to the NFL. So um, when I got cut, I made a decision. I'm going to go to Canada. I'm going to play my butt off and I'm going to make it back to the NFL. And it's what's so funny. I would get these text messages the NFL PA sends out these text messages every Friday. And for me, it was like my only connection with the NFL. I would read them and I would be like, man, one day I'm going to be, I'm going to get these messages. I'm going to be back in the league. So 16, I go to Canada on a two year deal. A guy named Jim Barker. He's like been, he's been a GM, a head coach. He's done media. He called me and he said, you're going to love football again. And um, that's what really got me because I wanted to love the game again. I wanted to have that, just that looseness that I had at Ohio State with the game and get away from the business. And so just going to Canada, obviously, it's not as heavily televised. It's not as much marketing. I was able just to like hone in on the game. Uh, I played in five games in 2016, which made up my rookie contract because you have to sign a two-year deal. It's called a one-on-one. Um, it's you sign and the team gets the option for the second year. They always take the option, right? Cause they want you on a two year rookie yeah. deal. So I took the one and one, the five games, uh, represented my first season. So 2017, I was Wait, we're on, talking about, we're talking about with Toronto, right? Toronto, Oregon, Oregon. Yeah. A one year deal. Um, in the off season, they signed a, a man named Mark Tressman. He was with the Ravens as offensive coordinator in 2016. He got fired and he, had some success in the CFL in Montreal. He had won four championships. So he went back to the CFL. Um, the thing about Tressman that I love, I played for two head coaches that have wrote books, Jim Tressel, the winner's manual. And then Mark Tressman, he wrote a book called Perseverance. So every single day he had this, like, it wasn't like quiet time that Tressel did, but he had this moment where he would want you to reflect about like what you're doing it for. And um, this team building idea that he had, just taking each day one step at a time, getting to know your teammates, getting to know their journeys and understanding everybody that's here has gone through adversity. Um, I got to play with some incredible vets in the CFL. It's a guy named Ricky Ray. He was a quarterback. He was the only quarterback in the CFL to win four championships. So he's the most winningest quarterback in CFL history. Um, SJ Green, he's a 10,000 yard receiver. He's won three championships up there. So those guys really helped my learning curve, understanding the waggle, understanding the different angles, using the whole field, um, the timing because of the field length and just understanding defenses in the CFL. And so we were able to have, uh, it was a crazy year. We were nine and nine and ran the table and won the Grey Cup. And I just think, you know, and I got hurt. I missed five games that year. And then when I came back, I just had this like Mamba mentality, Mamba focus. Cause um, trust me, I, I always tell them and I, I'll text them, you know, and say, man, I appreciate you. I feel like, you know, you, you helped save my life. And um, because what I learned that year was uh, how to become like a better husband and a better father. The CFL has a four hour rule, Tim, where you have four hours to get meetings in and practice in. Right. And um, so nine to two, um, 
I'll be out of there and that's cold tub time, all of that. So I can go to white, I can go to lunch with my wife, take my kids to the park. And, and so I really got to live that professional dream up there. And um, he had me reading books by Edgar Tolley, The Power of Now and New Earth. And, and it just really wow. helped me along my journey, you know, get my mental together. And um, cause I was pretty angry at football. I'm pretty angle, angry at coaches. And um, I was able to get my best play out of myself at that at age 27 and was able to win a great cup and great cup MVP. It was just a special night and, and earn a contract back to the NFL. So I was able to accomplish my goals and sign back to Baltimore. And it was just one of those things where, Hey, like, I could see the difference, right? I had three transitions, NFL to CFL. There's things about the game. And then from the CFL to the NFL, there's there's advantages that I noticed. And then um, going, and then after I got cup in Baltimore, I appreciate John Harbaugh for giving me a shot and an opportunity. Um, and then when I went back, I kind of said, hey, I'm going to finish my career up here and had a few other stops in Vancouver with the BC Lions, Montreal with the Mon Montreal Alouettes. Yeah. Hamilton, COVID year, and then I finished in BC. So very, very appreciative for being able to play in North America, all of North America, right? Uh, I got friends and family, and, you know. Coast to Vancouver, coast. <laughs> Vancouver to New York, man, from Montreal to Houston. Um, I, I have friends and, and colleagues and, and people that I can call for favors, and it's uh, it was an amazing journey, and I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. You would, you know, as a football player, you would like to have played. Uh, most football players would like to have played the same place for 15 years, I would think, although you'd be beat up by that. 15 years, you'd like, like to have four to five rings on your fingers. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and then, boom, you're done with that. And now, you know, everybody in whatever town you ended up in, that's where you are. Uh, that's one way of looking at an experience and going, boy, that was rich. The other way is, like I just, like you just pointed out, you went coast to coast with your football career. Your experiences yeah. at Ohio State from the highs to the lows, the yeah. lows being not getting to play and then finally coming back to get to play. But my point is, uh, as you look back on it now, Devere, uh, how much richer of a human being are you? Just, I mean, heck, man, as you and I were talking about before we started this uh, this show today, just the moves you made, you know, with your family. And I'm not sure they, you know, I'm sure they probably went with you everywhere because you're, a, you know, you're a family man. But uh, but just the moves you made, just you can get enriched and not and not to say a word to anybody, just the experiences. But how much richer of a human being are you now having experienced all of that? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I do. Um, I think um uh... You know, the one it's it's a one percent like I would I like to use Cam Hayward as an example. Right. You know, he's been in Pittsburgh. Yeah. A well. lifer. <laughs> I think the public and the fan base thinks that's what the professional life is made of. But there's more people who have journeys like mine. Yes. Than Cam like Cam is a one percenter of one percenters, you know, like that's that's a very special hall of fame type career, right? And even there's even hall of famers who have had to switch cities, but that's a 1% type of guy and, and hats off to him. He's earned every bit of it, but it's interesting. You, you brought up that, like the journey, right? We, we went to Hawaii, we went to Maui as a family in, in January. And there's this thing called the road to Ohana. And it's this eight hour drive, right? And, these people, you know, we were one of them. You want to get to Ohana, but when you get there, there's nothing really yeah. there. Yeah. The way there's trails with breathtaking views. There's a point where you're above the clouds and you can kind of see some, you know, see all of Maui and the ocean. There's spots where there's black sand beaches and pink sand beaches. There's waterfalls. And, um, and I think so goes with life, right? Like it's about the journey. It's about the things you see along the way, the experiences you have on the way to Ohana and not necessarily Ohana as the destination. For me, it was about the journey, right? The the brotherhood, the living in different cities, the things I learned about this town, that town, the things I learned about, you know, 
currency exchange or doing taxes in two countries or um, have, you know, working a business from across the border or what, what does life look like after football? Um, you know, those edges that I was able to get because right, like there's guys in the CFL who know, like, you know, this is my last stop. So I have this business, I have that business. Um, and then being able to learn from those guys. And uh, the funny thing about Canadian players on a rookie deal, they pay back their college scholarships because they don't get college scholarships. They, they have to pay for school. So you learn how to live smaller, right? You learn how to, you know, save each dollar. For me, that was huge because I was coming from an NFL lifestyle where guys live so big, yeah. you know, I was able to change my ways and, and, and now I can, you know, participate in business. I don't have to work a job because I learned, you know, how to save. I learned how to, um, put my family first and not my desires first. And, and, uh, it, I learned team building uh, that I can translate to business. Right. You know, I learned how to, we won a championship. I, I understand how you can maximize each day and, and, um, give your brother your, you know, your full effort for a common goal. Um, I learned how to, uh, just calm my mind down and, and, and manifest things that I would like to see in my life. I learned to overcome. And, um, so anything that's thrown at me now, um, I think I'm pretty much prepared for it. And, and that's what the journey is about is the destination. Um, it's so crazy. I've been doing motivational speaking to him and I always talk about this. And, um, and, and I want you to highlight this for sure. Like the dream of the first attention is our first dream, right? Like for me, it was being a Buckeye and going to the NFL. And, and I, I dreamed that dream when I was kid. Right. But the thing about the dream of the first attention, it prepares you for the dream of the second attention. And the dream of the second attention is, is what your life purpose is. Right. So when you live in that second dream, it's your purpose on this earth. My my purpose on uh, inspiring people are, you know, leading my household, my wife, my children. I got three boys. It, it they they don't know the athlete to be right. I got an eight year old, a three year old, and a newborn. They they won't know the guy who was getting up at six and working, but they see me now with those habits. Right, I get up early. You know, I read the Bible. I, I meditate. You know, they see me ready for the day. Um, they see me teaching them how to fight through adversity. And so I learned all of that in my first dream, which is allowing me to uh, give them a foundation in my purpose, which is my second dream. So that's how I look at things. And that's how I've been able to embody it and appreciate this journey, honestly. Yeah. Dude, uh, I covered the Buster Douglas, Mike Tyson fight way back when over in Tokyo. <laughs> And uh, after the fight, you know, you know what happened there. And uh, anyway, in the post post fight press conference, uh, here comes uh, Mike Tyson. They bring Mike Tyson in and everybody's asking questions. And I ask him, I said, Mike, uh, you know, you knocked out 30, 31 guys. What's it like to get knocked out? <laughs> you know, you know, he'd never been knocked out, you know, and uh, and he and this is Mike Tyson. And I'm paraphrasing here to a certain extent. But he said, listen, my friend, you know, you don't judge a man by his by his victories, you judge a man by by the way he comes back from adversity, which I thought was a really deep answer to kind of a flippant question. You know what I mean? And uh, and and the point is, the adversity is what really you know you talk about iron sharpens iron, but adversity is what really sharpens a man, isn't it? I mean, and coming back from it, and uh, you, I think you felt that many times in your in your football career, right? Yeah, man, I, I think it's helping me uh, in fatherhood a lot, right? Just because. You know, my son, he wants to play sports. And um, I think the initial dad move is to be the coach, right, and be able to pull the string, yeah. allow him to play. I was my son's 707 coach, Tim. He fired – I mean, he dropped two snaps, and I fired his ass. <laughs> it's, you'll never play quarterback again, son. And he's looking at me. He's like, Dad, what I got to play quarterback? Son, you're not a quarterback. And – I can't protect him from his adversity, but I can only prepare him for the world. Right. And, and I think it's allowing me to really teach them lessons about um, 
how the world really is and and and, and how how tough you kind of have to be right yeah you know like he he's not going to grow up in a situation that I grew up in obviously because you know I am who I am but I can allow him to learn from sports in the same way that I learned from sports I remember my youth coaches always tell me man sport man football is a lot like life and I would just look at him like no it's not but then now as a grown man you know sports can teach you so much and um and I'm a big advocate on that discipline that you learn from it so um yeah my adversity has has, has helped shape me um it's it's made me resilient um it's made me um appreciative and, and gratitude and you know it, the level is very high and and um same people that you meet on the way up are the same people you meet on the way down and, and I think I've been very successful at just being the same person on the way up and the way down and and, and adversity has humbled me right it's allowed me to to be like that so I'm, I'm thankful for that you know I thank God every day for the journey that we've been on and, and I really believe you know, he wants to use me to to help a lot of other guys, you know, along this journey for sure. Hey, last couple of things. Number one, have you ever have you ever been around? I mean, and maybe I'm wrong about this. I think Jim Trussell is one of the great rocks, steps, whatever you want to take talk about it on your journey up and down. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? Uh just you know, he just retired from being uh, uh yeah. from being the president of Youngstown State University after being one of the more successful college football coaches in history i mean you talk about a resume right and uh who knows what he's going to do next maybe he will become a senator <laughs> you know we used to call him senator trussell but uh, uh more behind his back than in front of his back but uh in a nutshell what did he what did he mean what does he mean to you what does he mean to your life and and that's you know this is you you and i didn't even talk about this he you know he may not even be a major factor i don't know you know the way you look at it but i'm just thinking coming in contact with that guy for four years, what did it, as you look back on now, what did it mean to you, uh, to your life and your experiences? Um, I think just the way he led by example, I mean, he has this incredible gift um, beyond the, the X's and O's, beyond the media, but this connection with people that he has, right? This, yeah. this thing that he can do where you can tell him one thing and he'll never forget it about you know, your aunt, auntie or your uncle or your brothers or sisters. He had like, he has this gift, this like, this gift of, gift of empathy that's impeccable and its emotional intelligence is extremely high. I think I learned how to shake the CEO's hand and treat him the same way I would treat the janitor from Jim Trussell, right? Yeah. I, I learned how to take the high road from him. Um one thing that he asked of me before he stepped down was you don't get any second chances to where you gotta, you gotta take the high road at, at all points in your life. And I think it served me on the field. It served me within my marriage. It served me within business, within this communications world that the high road might be a little bit, you know, the detour might be a little bit longer, but it's going to always pay off. And then, and then on top of that, just um, the type of leader he was, right? Um, he was a guy that could encourage loudly, but he would criticize softly. And, and I think that's how he got the best out of his players and, you know, his staff. And, and if you look at his tree, I mean, there's, you know, I mean, you can go yeah. down, the list, you know, Fickle, D'Antonio, like, you know, PJ Fleck, like there's been guys who, who've been around this man who have this like special connection with people. And, um, and I think that's what I really, you know, learned from him were, were those three things. And then obviously just the way he carried himself, right? Like, yeah. I don't know how many sweater vests are in his closet. I like to think there's only three of them. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's the same guy when he puts that vest on every single, every single day, he, you know what you're going to get from him. Yeah. And, and I, and I'm just really blessed to have crossed paths with him and and um and be able to be one of his students and his players and just still lean on to this day. You know, I call him for advice and um how to handle things. And uh it, it's it's a blessing to come across a man like that for sure. Dude, real quick, I mean, I you know, I just turned 69 this past week and uh, uh I got a few, I got a few, you know, obviously uh 
party for, you know by my family and stuff. But uh, one of the guys who called and left the message was Jim Trussell, you know, <laughs> and why he remembers my birthday, you know, yeah. every year is beyond me. I remember his birthday every year, too, and stuff. But, uh, you know, yeah. uh, we'll talk about that some other time. I want to ask you one last thing before we get out of here, because this has gone on longer than you allotted, but that's your fault. Um, uh, as I always like to say, one more question. Marvin Harrison Jr., are we looking, are we seeing something special? Should people understand uh, and enjoy whether they win every game or not. Should people understand and enjoy uh, just like you special players come along, you know what I mean? And uh, they're never promised, but just when you think you've seen it all, I'm seeing a Marvin Harrison jr. You know, uh, mm -hmm. should do people understand what they're in Ohio state fans understand what they're getting uh, to, to bear witness to. And uh, how good is this guy? Maybe I'm putting it over the top for you there. I don't know. No, 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 you're, you're not. I don't think you're giving it enough. Um, I think the thing with him, you, you could argue that this guy, Marvin Harrison Jr., has a Ph.D. in route running. Here's why. He was around one of the greatest route runners, wide receivers ever, his father, as a kid. Um, and then he's around one of the – brightest, youngest football minds in all of college football, Brian Hartline. And standing 6'4", 4'4", 4'3", maybe, you know, incredible body um, and incredible body control. We're witnessing uh, a generational receiver. And the thing about, you know, Jackson Smith and Jigba, he's a generational receiver himself, but yeah, he's in a class – of like a one year, two year kind of flash, right? Like a, you know, a guy, you know, like a that's had a good couple of years. But the thing with Marvin, he's in a upper echelon of college wide receivers. He's in the Keyshawn Johnson, Larry Fitzgerald, Calvin Johnson type of class where when he makes it to the pros, just like Joe Klatt said, he'll be the best receiver in the NFL almost immediately. And it's because of his pedigree, his work ethic, yeah. um, his character, um, his never being satisfied. I love hearing his clips because he's just going at each day. And, and like he gets that from his dad, like his dad wasn't a big media guy. His dad was a worker. And so he has that worker's mentality. But his dad wasn't six four nope. or four with impeccable body control and been around a hall of fame receiver. So we're witnessing a Larry Fitzgerald type of phenomenon, Calvin Johnson type of phenomenon as Ohio state fans. And there hasn't ever been a guy like him at Ohio state. Nope. Won't ever be a guy like him at Ohio state again. And I think that we should appreciate him. Um, he's already providing shade to this campus and Buckeye Grove. And um, he'll he'll his legacy will live on decades after. And, um, and I've got to meet the kid and obviously got to see him play a lot. Just covering Ohio State last year. He's a very special wide receiver product. And um, and we're very luck lucky to get to watch him wear scarlet and gray for sure. Yeah, well, I'll I'll, I'll end this with a sappy segue. I'm. I've always been felt lucky to have met guys like you, man. I mean, I've always enjoyed, you know, you remember you and I used to talk when we could way back in the day and I loved your mom and, and uh, just getting to know her and stuff. And uh, uh, I appreciate you coming on the Tim May show, Devere. No problem, man. Thanks for having me, Tim. It was fun. I always like talking about the old times. That's right, man. Old times, new times, and who knows what's coming around the corner, right? Just, don't drop any of those uh, concrete walls, my man. Uh, I'm thinking liability. I'm thinking your liability insurance for your company's got to be all through the roof. Am I right about that? Cargo insurance is very expensive monthly, yes. <laughs> yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Devere Posey. And until next week, this is Tim May with the Tim May Show. We'll see you then.